All right, everybody, it's been a while, but we are back for Revisiting Shore Z Season 2. If you aren't familiar with the Revisiting series, the sole purpose of this series is to go back in time and take a look at everything that happened in a particular show or movie. This go around, of course, we are looking at Season 2 of Shore Z. And without wasting any more time, let's get started. We begin Episode 1 with a conversation between Nat and Shore Z, asking him what he's going to do differently, where we see Shore Z, once again, looking over at the gym equipment. It's training time. We then move on to see the Sudbury Blueberry Bulldog celebrating another victory, but not just any victory, the 2022 No-Show Championship. This team will never lose again. We then move on to our Brodu Questionable Call segment with Anik, Tess, Jay, and RA, and kick off the segment with a quick mic'd up montage of Shorzy doing his thing against various teams. Hey, when you're driving by a field of cows, how hard is it to not just pull over and rope one of them right there? Fuck you, Shorzy. To say the least, Shorzy is still the menace that we all know and love. Now, as for the vow that Shorzy made about his team never losing again, we learn that that still remains true. As it currently stands since their last game with the Sioux Cyclones, they really haven't lost again. And as such, the Bulldogs are on a 20-win streak and are showing no signs of losing anytime soon. But a key thing to note here is that if they keep this up and win the final four games, they will have a flawless season, which has never been done before. The best part is this isn't just a one-man show. It's noted that everyone is doing their part, from Michaels being crowned as the best goalie in the league, all the way to Jean-Jacques Francois Jacques Jean leading the league in goals earned. But there is one problem with being the best team in the league, a flawless one at that. The problem is that everyone is gunning to take you down. And with the final four games being against Timmins, North Bay, Sioux Michigan, and then Sioux Michigan one more time, the Bulldogs have to stay on their A game if they really want to end the season flawless. But with four games remaining and four wins away from a record-breaking season, it's up to the Bulldogs. They can be the best team in the league this year, or they can be the best team in the league ever. But now that we're done with singing our praises, there is another key problem. We're hammering too much ass. That's why we're here. And with such distractions, this can leave with some of the players' heads not being fully in the game. And seeing how no one wants this more than Shorzy, he's completely determined to make sure the guys don't steer off course and lose sight of what they've all been working so hard for. The issue with their newfound popularity that came with being the best in the league is that everybody wants you and not only that, but Sudbury is famously known to having an impossible amount of good looking girls there. But luckily for us, we won't have to worry about our coach single net doing any cruising. And that's because he and me got already an item. Guilty. Hanger. Don't be a pussy. She's my girlfriend, my guy. Yeah, but you're not going to be like... <laughs> Nat gives Shorzy his props and says that he went above and beyond for both himself and the team. But us being so damn good leads us to a big problem. With now all of them being so in shape and good looking now, like I said earlier, everybody wants them. Nat isn't off the hook either though. She's the one that created these monsters. And they are a product of her own design. She even went as far as making them do a sexy calendar. I can't believe you got him to do that shit. That calendar is going to bite us in the ass one day, Nat. But the reason for the calendar was a good one. The money raised from is going to be used to host the national senior tournament. If, of course, they win the bid. In the following scene, Shorzy sits his friends down and lets them know that they're hammering way too much ass. While Dolo and Goody have mostly been doing this for friends with benefits, Hitch, on the other hand, knows that he's a one-woman type of guy. <laughs> There's also a quick little dispute about who's the ugliest of the group, and Shorzy believes that it's Hitch. However, when Hitch asks his prospective partner Bethany Dawn what she thinks, she says it's Shorzy. Dolo then asks his girl Melody who says it's Hitch, and then a third girl named Brittany emerges from one of the rooms and says that Shorzy is the ugliest. And during this little back and forth after everyone realizes that Frankie is present, we learn that he failed to get Laurel's back. Yeah, that's a shame. But over at the rink, Nat, Zeke, and Meek after talking about how ugly Shorzy looks in the calendar photo, began to come up with ways to get the youth to also come to their games. Moving on to the following night, it's time for us to face the Timber Kings. The gems then run past Shorzy's group and apologizes for being late, and says that they were playing something called Reach for the Top. I'm noting this now because this actually becomes a key plot point later on. But speaking of Reach for the Top, Dolo asks the gems what that is. Michaels excitedly tries to explain to Dolo that it's a trivia game, but Shorzy tells him to shut up. One of the gems continues to explain that they run a trivia league at the jail that they work at and the game is actually named after our old Canadian game show. But more on that later. It is finally game time and the cameras are rolling. And before the game can even start, the Abadorans make clear to them that they're coming for the Bulldogs' streak. 
I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little nervous about how the first game was going to go, especially after all the warnings and emphasis we put on never losing again and also how we're on a 20 game win streak, but we finished the game off 2-0. As Nat, Zeke, and Migo are walking by the locker room, sure as he can be heard getting onto his team. Listen. Where Nat then notes, We thought he was bad trying to get us out of the bottom. He is way worse trying to keep us at the top. You want to chit chat with Appledore in between plays? Go fuck him up the ass and get it over with. And that could be bad in and of itself. But we'll see if this comes back to bite him later on. Fish! You used to get a goal a fucking game. How many did you get tonight? Zero. Huh? Zero. In the game before that. Zero. In the game before that. Zero. In the game before that. Zero. You don't get one either. Yeah, how the team currently is right now, this could get bad. But meanwhile, over at Peddler's Pub, Dolo Hitch and some of the other players are shown out with girls, despite Shorzy's warning for them to slow down. Even Michaels is out with the team, but he's drinking alone. Nat Zeke and Ming notice this and says that he's been acting strange. And though he's done a great job at making sure the other team doesn't score, they know that they're mainly winning because of Frankie, who's responsible for scoring both goals that they got that game. Look at them. No wonder they have no legs in the third. They already played a period between the sheets. Shorzy's on it. You know he wants a fucking record. Seeing Zeke actually say something nice about Shorzy catches Nat and Meek off guard. But honestly, it's nice to see that she gives credit where credit is due. And speaking of Shorzy, he's in the company of the beautiful Laura Moore. Guess the rest of them just have to decide. Yeah. Do they want to be the best team in the league this year? Or do they want to be the best team in the league ever? Better decide quick. Mm-hmm. Because they're coming. <laughs> Moving on to episode 2, we see that Shorzy and Laura Moore are having breakfast together at Eddie's sports bar and restaurant. But it's not a date, just business. Laura needs a quote from her article. When Shorzy begins to speak, she knows that he should look in the person's direction when he's talking to someone. However, in Shorzy's case, he says that he can't end this situation because she's just so beautiful that he can't look at her and focus at the same time. Look, I've made mistakes in the past, okay? I show myself to people too quickly, then I get hurt. Try for me. All right, but you look like that, so don't be surprised if I look like I want to be underneath you. The moment that he decides to look at her, he just begins to gush about her beauty. Hey, you ever look at someone, they look so good, you just want to go, no way! No. Have you ever had that? You look at someone, you just want to go, all right! I said this in the first season, but I'll say it again now. The way that Shorzy looks at Laura Moore gets me every goddamn time. But anyway, when she realizes that she's likely not going to get a quote as he currently is, she gets up and heads for the door. She tells him to just text her a quote. As Laura begins to head for the door, she stops for a moment and her curiosity gets the best of her. What do you really say about me? You're smart, capable, rational, dependable, outgoing, kind, consistent, you're a leader. And you smell so fucking good. Yeah? Quote me. And with that, flirting time is over and we're back to focusing back up. Shorzy is now overseeing everyone's training. And pretty much throughout the entire thing, he's just badgering them. I've got to hand it to everybody though. It takes a lot of patience to handle Shorzy. Sanguinette then retrieves Shorzy to discuss the next order of business. That being Frankie and his rising popularity. It turns out he's getting his own calendar. Shorzy tries to argue that he and the rest of the team should be focused on the final three games instead of doing things like this. Nat does agree that they should be focusing and then asks him what they have been doing and if they really have been focusing. However, we know that that still isn't the case. Seeing how Frankie has the most goals in the no-show, there's no excuse why he can't be used elsewhere just for one afternoon, just so they can do the photo shoot for her solo calendar. Zeke goes on to ask if Frankie's following in general really is that big, and Nat says that he's the biggest reason why so many bums are in seats. Shorzy, on the other hand, thought that it was because his team was on a 20-win streak, but Meek sets the record straight and says that the people who are showing up for Frankie aren't exactly there for the love of the sport, but rather for the love of the player. Yep, Frankie is a fan favorite of the gays. And as such, the Sudbury gay community is offering a lot of money for a Frankie exclusive calendar. Fucking the entire team strips down and greases up and all gay dudes want is Frankie. Read it in week. This is especially funny seeing how just last episode, Shorzy and his friends were trying to figure out who was the hottest of the group. But anyway, over at the Laughing Buddha, Shorzy fills everyone in on the new calendar for Frankie. 
As for the man of the hour, he seems pretty unfazed. Instead of letting this bother him any further, Shorzy decides to focus on their upcoming matches. But that doesn't mean the others aren't going to bring it up. Enough about the calendar, boys. Let's get focused. Not one more word about it. That calendar is going to fall around for the rest of your life, you dumb fuck. <laughs> the entire time he's here, they just lay into Shorzy. Where did it all go wrong, Shorzy? Well, it's a good thing about in your beer league, boys. At least I see it can get much worse. Yeah, did you tuck your dick back between your legs for that, too? Doesn't matter, Corey. Your mom will still find a way to grab it. Fuck you, Shorzy. Liam, did you know your mom calls her mid or wet wallet? Fuck, Fuck you. you. Boys, just tell your moms to leave me alone. I'm not getting matching tattoos with them. I hope the Yanks fucking toss you, Shorzy. Not worried about the Yanks, boys. I'm worried about the Yanks, boys. Cutting to the meeting in Nat's office, she lets them know that she's worried about how they are going to hold up against the Yanks. Shorzy tries to reassure her by saying that they're 3-0 against them. Nat goes further and says that it's not their skill that she's worried about, but rather their will. As it currently stands, the Bulldogs are the only things keeping the Americans from also being the best at hockey. Once they've wrapped up their conversation, Zeke asks why the gyms are always late and we finally see what the trivia game is all about. What Manitoba town is famous for guided polar bear tours? Churchill. What town in Prince Edward Island is also the name of a brand of French fries? Cavendish. Who has the second most all-time points among Canadian-born NHL hockey players? Mark Messier. To say the least, the gems are getting wiped by the inmates. Meanwhile, back at Shorzy's place, he's talking with Goody and Dola about their flings and says that they need to get it out of their systems today so they can focus on their match against the Yanks. Moving on to Frankie during his photo shoot, he gets a visit from his girlfriend, Rave. Yeah. If you remember how things ended between him and Laurence last season, you can see how this could be a problem. But anyway, over at Pippi Panini, Shorzy spots Fish on a date with Alice. To further clarify, his first date with Alice. What the fuck do you think you're doing? What? Huh? What? Well, you stopped scoring a goal a game, but you got lots of time for chit chats. Are you serious? Wish I had more time for chit chat. By the way, Michaels is also there and grills Fish as well. And taken off guard by his presence, Shorzy asks what Michaels is doing by himself. Michaels was actually getting ready to explain too, but before he can, Shorzy spots a suit training outside. And on his way out the door, he lets Michaels know that people have noticed him acting weird. We then cut over to the rink and Shorzy is with Nat and Sanguinette to discuss the suit, where it's revealed that they are already there doing what they call peak performance imagery. Sanguinette notes the suit's level of dedication compared to the Bulldogs. And I can't lie y'all, these guys do not look like they're playing around. Since they last played, the Sioux has added three new guys to their roster. The first being Matt Delaney, who is the first front pick and has three years in the show. The second is Brady Schnur, who has over a thousand games in the show and a couple hundred in the minors. And the third is Dale Palmer. And this guy is huge. He has half a season in the show and when he realized that no one would fight him, he ended up quitting. Americans have to be the best at everything. They're obsessed with it. They want to be the best fucking bad. Guilty as charged. Moving on to episode 3, we get a quick opening scene showing Shorzy um, marking his territory on the Sioux's charter bus. But back in Nat's office, Sanguinette and Shorzy are being told some of the interesting information about one of the Sioux's players named Delaney. Apparently over at the Colson, he was on the strip club side. As for how we came across that information, well... Because I was in there too. Both she and Delaney happened to be in the VIP section enjoying themselves. Aren't you dating a guy now? It wasn't that night. Out roaming for canal, lazy. She also reveals that he was doing cocaine. It turns out the night was young. He was going to the wee hours, going hard. Oh, well, Delaney loves the snooters. I don't know how he was getting any up there after a certain point. How do you know that? Because I was in there too. We'll see if this affects a mini come game time. But if nothing else, Shorzy has some chirping ammunition. And boy, does he waste no time letting it unload. For the most part, Delaney is keeping his cool, but it does strike a nerve with Palmer, so I suppose you could say that he's getting in their heads. However, seeing how the gems aren't exactly all there right now, this might cause an issue when it's time for them to take care of big boy Palmer. I've got a pretty good idea on who's setting the tone tonight. Who's gonna set the tone, Sanger? Who's gonna fucking set it? Jimmy, ready? Yeah. Yeah, cause you're going. Yeah! Immediately, Shorty can tell something is wrong. He doesn't say anything, but he definitely notices and has a bad feeling about what's to come. The problem with all this is that the gyms are meant to set the tone and get Palmer out of the game early. And unlike the gyms, Palmer is already revved up and ready to go. And once it's time for them to set the tone, almost instantly we can tell that this is not going our way. And Palmer comes out victorious. As the game proceeds, it goes pretty much as expected. With both teams trading goals, but with the Sioux scoring first. 
making the score after the first period 1-2 to two in favor of the Sioux. Come second period, we didn't waste any time tying the game, but it's not long after that the Sioux answered back with a goal of their own. Another gym is sent out to face Palmer, but unfortunately like the first time, Palmer comes out victorious again. And just like that, we have now finished the second period 2-3. to three. The gyms failing to set the tone isn't the only issue. Collectively, the Bulldogs just aren't doing so hot. Sanguinette mentions Dolo, and Shorzy mentions Goody. Once again, he says it's because they've already played a period between the sheets, referring to the girls that they've been having over at Shorzy's place every day. Frankie is also noted to be distracted as well. And with all of this, they're looking at one person to get them out of their hole, Fish. Hoping that he can save the game and be the scorer that he's known to be, they add him to the lineup. However, they make it known that if he fails to score this game, he will be cut from the team. I'm cut. You used to score us a goal a game. How many did you get last game? Zero. And the game before that? Zero. And the game before that? Zero. And the game before that? Zero. No use for scorers who don't score. That is a lot of pressure, especially against a team like the Sioux. So yeah, I feel bad for Fish. And needless to say, he's not happy, but he understands his role and intends to live up to it. And that he does. Not just by scoring one point, he goes on to score the game winning goal, allowing the Bulldogs to win 4 to 3. After the game, as Fish heads to the locker room, Shorzy and Sanguinette acknowledge his efforts. Fish lets them know that the way that they put him in the hot seat wasn't cool, and tells them to never do it again. And on the topic of that, I do admit that Sanguinette's methods did show results. But at the same time, I get where Fish is coming from. Nevertheless, our win streak continues with the Big 22 and Fish is awarded the first drumstick. Sanguinette then calls Shorzy out of the locker room and Nat tells him that the press is waiting. He initially thinks that she's talking about Laura Moore. It's a different press opportunity. Oh, she hot? Is he dying? No. What do you think of the fucking rock? Zeke explains that they're doing this because they want more kids to come to games. This is all in an effort to keep them off the streets. First you got us with our dinks out and calendars and now you want us on a kid show? It is a bit weird when he puts it that way. His name is Jory. What? Jory. Oh my god. Hold up. But yeah, the interview is as awkward as you'd imagine. Unfortunately, the only fan question he had was about the calendar and Shorzy being Shorzy kept his answer snarky, short, and sweet. Great job on the calendar. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. You understand that's out there forever now? Think you'll have kids one day? Maybe you can't. If a kid came to school and said, hey, look at this calendar. It's your dad. You can't get much worse than that. Only if you got a name like Jory Jordan. After the interview, they meet back in Nat's office to talk about the team's overall performance. And Shorzy doesn't deny how bad everyone did. It's also revealed that the reason why Frankie's head is elsewhere is because his girlfriends have been ghosting him. And yes, you heard that right. Girlfriends. Plural. We lightly cover all the problem guys. Goody, Hitch, the gems, and then Meeg asks about Fish. Sanguinette, did you threaten to cut Fish if he didn't score? Who ratted? It wasn't a threat. Sanguinette. Nat tells him that that was over the top and not to do it again, and then sends Shorzy and Sanguinette off to fix their team's problems. After they leave, we get a surprise visit from Brady Schnur, who plays for the Sioux. Unfortunately, you got a problem with all three showerheads in the visitor's locker room. I got caught working late today, ended up taking my truck to the game. Luckily, I had some Teflon tape in there, and I fixed the seals where the heads meet the holes. But as for the heads themselves, do you have any CLR? While this is going on, Nat is noticeably quiet and stiff as he explains the situation. Have your arena guy run him through that for a couple minutes. He'll be as good as new. Good night. And as he leaves, they decide to call her out on her behavior. You don't date sluts, remember? Yeah, you just take them down. Mm -hmm. So... I'm gonna fuck that slut. <laughs> Moving on to episode 4 in the opening scene, we see that Nat meant what she said. She did, indeed, fuck that slut. Afterward, we jump to the locker room where Sangle Nat is holding a players only meeting where they call out everyone who's off their A-game. We first address the gems and Sangle Nat brings up them constantly being late and also when they are here, even after their games they don't stick around. They reveal that it's all because of their reef for the top trivia and the fact that they've been losing. Apparently their fourth guy who they heavily relied on to set the tone ended up getting stabbed by one of the inmates. Ever since, they've been without a fourth. 
So first things first, we need to find him a fourth trivia member. Sensing that this meeting is gonna run a little long, they continue this player's only meeting at the Laughing Buddha. And to figure out who's the smartest, they decide to ask trivia questions. Oh, by the way, Frankie is still being ghosted by his girlfriends. And that's why we see him on his phone like he was doing in the locker room. But back to finding the gems of fourth, the candidates are Hitch, Michaels, and Shorzy. As they're being interviewed, Goody asks Dolo if he thinks there are any girls around, where Sanguinette states that they will be discussing their problem next, aka their sex addiction. But in the meantime, we move things over to the Colson where there are indeed girls. Even some we've seen hanging out around Shorzy's place from past sexcapades. Frankie continues to badger Shorzy about wanting to make a call and Dolo and Goody let him know, him being Shorzy, that Frankie hasn't heard from his girlfriends. To that, Shorzy says that he better hope that they haven't heard from each other. And yeah, you definitely need to remember that for a little bit later. But back to the topic of trivia, it's time to ask a trivia question in order to see who is going to be the gymnast fourth for their trivia league. At Hitch's request, the topic is space. However, before he even gets the chance to go himself, he, Dolo, Goody, all get approached by girls to go dance and other things. We also tackle Michaels' problem and apparently he's just lonely. I'm the best goalie in the league. Well, then why are you walking around like someone ran over your dog? <sighs> Look, you really gonna inhale and exhale like that? Just... There, you just did it again. You don't even know you're doing it. It's not success unless you have someone to share it with. And this actually gets Shorzy thinking. So much, in fact, he pays Laura Moore a visit at her house. Do you really need to inhale and exhale like that? Whoa. What? It's not success unless you have someone to share it with. Oh my god, Shorzy has learned something from Michaels. And fueled on liquid courage, he tries to up his romance and flirting and Laura notes his past history of being a slut. However, Shorzy persists. But god, kudos to Laura because she stands firm. The next day at Eddie's sports bar and restaurant, it is time for a mock trivia. First up is movie trivia where Michaels gets it right. Next is music and, once again, Michaels gets it right again. You know what, long story short, Michaels gets every single one right and he's chosen to be the fourth. Oh, and also Frankie is still glued to his phone and he is still being ghosted. But now let's see why. Je m'appelle Marie-Camille Robideau Leblanc et vous écoutez, hey, vous And in this tell all, she has invited guests. Yep, Frankie's girlfriends. Catherine St. Laurent, Lissandra Nadeau, and Rave. So here's the proper timeline of the relationships. Catherine was the first girlfriend and Frankie cheated on her with Laurence. By the way, she was also invited to be on the show, but she just declined. But anyway, during Frankie's time with Laurence, he was cheating on her with Lissandra. Then he cheated on Lissandra with Rave. Now that we have the timeline cleared up, Lissandra is given the chance to open up about Frankie's habits, mainly his diet. They decide to switch to English so the Ontario girls can be properly warned since that's where he lives. Lissandra goes on to say that one night she woke up with a honey nut cheerio between her toes. Then Catherine mentions the time when she checked Frankie's pockets when doing the laundry and she found a foot long Subway Philly cheesesteak and a McDonald's apple pie. And lastly, as for Rafe, she once came home with her smoke alarm going off because Frankie fell asleep with two pizza pops on the George Foreman grill. So long story short, it's not just constant cheating that's the problem, but it's dietary habits as well. Jean-Jacques, François, Jacques, Jean. Tu devrais avoir honte. So that happened. Now, let's see how Nat's doing. As she meets with Shorzy, he can immediately tell that she got laid just by looking at her. Zieg also notices. Meek then comes into the office to break the news that Frankie got caught, in reference to cheating on his girlfriends. And since he doesn't know yet, Nat tells Shorzy to keep the news away from him until after their big game. On the plus side of all of this, at least his calendar still sold out. Nat then asks Shorzy if there is a fire that she no longer has to worry about, and then we cut to see that the gems are prospering with their reach to the top trivia league, with Michaels as their new addition. They actually get every single question right. Now, it's finally game night and Shorzy is once again being interviewed by Jory Jordan for his kid's sports report. We got the North Bay Norseman tonight, but you need to get Keller. He can be a little pain in the knackers, can he? Yeah. Got a hot wife, though. Yeah? Mm hmm. Wanna see? Alright. Yeah. Got him in every picture, though. Wanna see McPherson's wife? Alright. Guess Jory isn't so bad after all. 
But now it is time to hit the ice and we are firing on all cylinders and we make two goals. However, after McPherson is caught trying to play dirty after going for a shot, Shorzy calls him out on it and says he'll wrap his stick around his neck if he does it again. McPherson smiles it off and Keller gets between them. During the next play while Shorzy is sitting on the bench, McPherson takes this as an opportunity to try to take another dirty shot, not heeding Shorzy's earlier warning. A little later as the ice is being clean, Shorzy takes this opportunity to skate over to McPherson and hits him in the face with his hockey stick. <sighs> he warns him. And thus brings us to episode 5 where we see the chaos ensuing on the ice and Shorzy dragging McPherson off of the rink and into the Bulldogs' bench. Once everyone's in the locker room, Shorzy awards the gems and Michaels with a drumstick. All around good show, I guess. Until... What if someone had their dick out? I puke at the look of it or laugh at the size of it. Oh my god. Let's go. You've been summoned by the league. For what? Turns out, due to Shorzy's actions on the ice, he's been summoned by the league. In response to this meeting, Shorzy just says that he hopes that Dennis is wearing something good because he finds her sexy. And understandably, Nat's a bit pissed because he's looking at getting suspended and all that he could think about is how hot Dennis and the others are. I've wailed on it to the thought of the three of them taking turns on. Really? If I'm wailing on it, there's no internet or anything, yeah. But yeah, they'll pick up Shorty tomorrow and now they move on to the next topic, Frankie. Apparently now he and his calendar is so popular with the gays that they want him to do an appearance. Sanguinet reveals that Nat ended up turning down the offer because she believes that she can make 10 times more than the original offer herself. Problem is, he won't even leave his room now. But that's what Shorzy is for. And hopefully we can get him out in time because we've got a gay night at the Colson coming up. Pam then pays her table a visit and we see that she and Hitch are hitting it off, especially after she compliments his shirt. Their mutual taste in music results in him asking her to come over later so they can listen to music together. And just when she's about to say yes, I fucked up. Oh, you're an idiot. No, you know how I said that success isn't success unless you have someone to share it with? My guy, did you go? Yeah, I went and saw Mercedes. However, Sanguinette tells him that just on his way here, he dropped his friend Augustine off at her place. And as for what she told Michaels, she says she wants to take it slow. And also that they need to see her brother because they still need to repay their debt from their assistance from last season. To further discuss, Michaels and Sanguinette pay her a visit. As a form of repayment for their debt, the Polichetes are requesting a favor from them. And this favor is specifically from Angelo. It turns out that word got back to Angelo that Frankie is doing an appearance at the Colson, which we learn is called the Man Advantage. And Angelo wants to go. Sanguinette says that he's not even sure that Frankie is going. And to that, Mercedes says that he will be not giving them much of a choice. As I think we should know by now what the Polichetes want, they get. For a little bit, Sanguinet is confused why Angelo would want to go to a gay night at the Colson. But after a couple of seconds to think, it finally clicks. Michaels didn't ask Mercedes if they can go for a glass of wine tonight, where she says that Sanguinet is bringing Augustine for her. So yeah, the bad luck continues for Michaels. She does, however, say that Sanguinet is invited to join her in Augustine. But he, of course, declines, saying that he has a date with Meeg. However, this only further piques her interest, and then she proposes that he bring her as well. Now, over at Shorzy's place, Frankie is still locked up in his room. He better get over this quickly, though, because whether we like it or not, the Polichetes have already cashed in their favor. And there are no refunds when it comes to those people. But now it's time to pay a visit to the League. While they're in the car discussing what their game plan is, that being Shorzy staying quiet, Nat notices a limo parked behind them with the door open. And having an idea of who it is, Shorzy gets out and goes to it. Yep, it is Mercedes with her brother Angelo. She's there to tell him that her and her brother will be arriving at 8 o'clock tonight to pick them up. That also includes Frankie because she expects them to go to the Man Advantage together. Shorzy tries to tell her that Frankie might not be up for it. And to that, Mercedes makes it clear that Frankie's attendance is not optional. That's what happens if Frankie's not sitting exactly where you are tonight. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I think they got their point across. <laughs> and now it's time for our meeting with the League. Dennis notes to the others how she thought Shorzy would be taller. Miguan? Hi, Aki. You're about the cutest thing I ever did see. She is the cutest thing I ever did see. What do you think, Nina? Well, we pops and rainbows. Ziguan? Aki. You smell like a urinal puck. Shorzy, smile a little for me, hon. I love these three so much. But um, back to business. 
Even though McPherson didn't have any broken bones or missing teeth, he did receive a pretty bad visor cut on his nose, resulting in a lot of blood. The League notes how they've been getting a lot of kids in the crowd recently, and that this is not something that should be seen if they want to be more family friendly. But due to Shorzy's popularity and also because of the good publicity that this is bringing, because all publicity is good publicity, they take it easy on him, only suspending him for one season, which only amounts to one game. However, they make it clear that he'll be back for the playoffs. Though the meeting is adjourned, Nat isn't happy with the verdict and she stands her ground. Good time to remind you these sessions are recorded. You don't decide what's good for the game. Hockey players have always governed themselves. That's what sets this game apart. She does a good job at getting her point across and they note how they have the best attendance in the league. But to spice things up and to further get on their good side, Nat mentions that Shorzy is extremely attracted to all three of them. Is that true? I'd love to meet your husbands. Why? Shake their hand. Oh yeah? Oh, I'd love to buy him a beer. In the end, they change their ruling and Shorzy is allowed to play the next game. Hearing that, Shorzy begins to tear up, so he turns around. After the meeting, he pays Laura a visit, letting her know that he's not suspended. Also, he uses this moment to invite her to the main advantage, where she gives him a maybe. We then cut to the next scene where we see Laurence getting out of her car to presumably pay Frankie a visit. Meanwhile, Shorzy hitched Dolo, Goody, and Michaels meet with Mercedes and Angelo to tell them that they have no idea where Frankie is. However, moments later, we see him with Laurence. It turns out she decides to give him a second chance. And now that everyone's here, it is time for the party. Everyone seems to be having a great time and overall, Gay Night appears to be a success. Only time will tell though if we made enough money from it to host the National Senior Tournament. But while everyone is dancing, we do see that Laura Moore took Shorzy up on his invitation and stopped by for him. As he's dancing with his friends, he spots her immediately and begins cheesing big time. As for Hitch, he's standing next to the bar when he sees Pam has finally arrived. She walks over to him and Hitch asks if she wants to dance. She's honest and says that she doesn't really like the music that's playing, but does offer an alternative, going back to his place to play some tunes, amongst other things maybe, but we'll leave that to the imagination. Laura Moore and Shorzy have some time alone outside where she asks why he's still so invested in hockey. It's the only place I can be me. What do you mean by that? In hockey, if someone disrespects you or your teammates, you can flatten them. One way or another, you get them. And when you do, everybody loves it. So, even though I'm at the age where half my hair is on the fucking shower floor, I'm gonna keep going to the rink. That's where I can be me. It is so nice to see Shorzy opening up like this. It just goes to show how much he is, one, interested in her, and two, how much he trusts her. But back to the scene, Laura's cab finally arrives. And as she's heading to get in, she asks if Shorzy wants to share a cab. He says that he can walk home from here, but Laura Moore clarifies and says that that cab would only be going to one place, her place. Yeah, she's giving him a chance. And now we are on episode six. Kicking off with the two month flashback, we see the Bulldogs doing their calendar photo shoot. We do see that originally they were fully clothed. Shorty then enters and oh my God, he is just full on orange. Confused, Shorty asks why Goody has his shirt still on. Ask for why. Because if I'm abroad looking at a sexy calendar of dudes, I'm probably hoping they have their tarps off. Everyone then goes on to call out Shorzy's god awful spray tan, and Shorzy says that he thought everyone would have gotten one because of the photo shoot. Nat then tells Shorzy to take his shirt off so then he can get ready for the photo shoot. But to that, he tells him that he wants to wait until he's fully greased down, and that just leaves everyone else in just more shock. As for his reason, it's the same as earlier. Because if I'm abroad looking at a sexy calendar of dudes, I'm probably hoping they're greased out. Out of curiosity, Nat asks if Shorzy's full body was that color, and Shorzy says yes. And honestly, I respect his dedication. Why did you do all this? Because a year ago, you were going to fold the team. We couldn't win a game. But then you kept the team together, and we won the lead. Now, no one can beat us. So, if you say you want us to do a sexy calendar so that you can host the National Senior Tournament. So we can. Whatever you need from me. Give your balls a tug. <clears throat> I got you. And time and time again, he has proven that. The way that this man doesn't take these opportunities for granted is just another reason why Shorzy is one of my favorite characters in the Letterkenny universe. 
I also love the fact that you can see Nat trying not to get too deep in her feelings. But with that, she tells the rest of the guys to get tanned up so they can get their tarps off and also grease down, following the lead of their captain. As the guys leave, Nat walks over to Shores, he takes off his sunglasses and tells him that he's the first up for the photo shoot. Back in the present day, we're back where we left off with Shorzy actually turning down going home with Laura Moore. As for why, accountability. I wouldn't ask you guys to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. I could have gone home last night with a girl I've been trying to take home for a year, and I didn't. Laura? No. Well, that's who you've been trying to take home for a it year. It wasn't Laura Moore. Shorzy's simple ask is for them to not go crazy all night the night before a game, which is reasonable seeing how it has affected them all season. Now for a quick update in the funding department since we're still looking to host a tournament, we are now only 10 grand short from our goal. Problem is, we're running out of time. As Nat, Zeke, and Meek think of another idea, we head to the Shore household where they're all sitting together and having dinner. They also toast to Shorzy's upcoming game and also Mikey, who turns out to be dating Shorzy's foster sister, Kayla. While they're getting the chance to learn more about him, Kayla reveals that he's an esports player. And as a part of the vetting process, Shorzy grills Mikey and I guess all things considered, you can say he handled it kind of okay. Esports are like really popular. Doesn't make him respectable. Hey, what's the concussion protocol in your league? What color are most of the kids? What's a trophy you play for the fucking Reese peanut butter cup? I heard Mikey's the hardest working player in this league. Hardest worker? The only thing these guys play through is having a fucking pee from drinking fucking Pop. Waffle. I only do it because I love you, Kayla. He gets vetted just like everybody who wants to date my family. Aw, oh, man. This family is something else. <laughs> Free also reveals that during one of the family vacations that they had in Cuba, Shorzy ended up making out with someone he thought was a girl. Fucking hottest guy I've ever seen. She was a real hot guy. Dad. He thought she was hot too. Hot guy. A lot can happen after 10 beers, huh, Waffle? Bye, he. I thought she was a girl. She was a real hot guy. Good lips. Dad. You know what? At least they're all in agreement. But anyway, after dinner is over, it's time for everyone to say their goodbyes and they all wish Shorzy good luck. <sighs> Are you crying? I love you. I love you too. <laughs> I'm glad we're all so close. Hey, success isn't success unless you have so much sure. We then immediately cut to Shorzy at Laura Moore's house. As Laura opens the door and sees that it's Shorzy, she takes off her shirt and begins to head up the stairs. Shorzy takes this as an invitation to come inside and closes the door behind him. It is finally happening. And meanwhile, over at Shorzy's place, Frankie and Laurence are just sitting on the couch and Dolo and Goody are being good on their word to Shorzy by declining sex the night before the game. And now it's time to jump into a bro dude segment to discuss their upcoming match against the suit and also the bad blood the Sioux have with the Bulldogs. Of course, Shorzy's actions in the last game didn't make anything better between them, but honestly, that's just to be expected at this point. Anik then ends the segment asking the reoccurring question that we've gotten this season. Do they want to be the best team in the league this year, or do they want to be the best team in the league ever? Only time will tell, and that time is now. Nat asks Meg if she wished saying that good luck, where she makes clear that she is his good luck charm. Then Meeg asks her if she has said hi to Brady Schnurr, and she says that she already did. She also reveals that she talked Schnurr into doing the pregame interview alongside Matt Delaney and Del Palmer. Though she did tell a little white lie and said that Jory has cancer, but hey, it's one less thing for the Bulldogs to worry about now. Nothing comes easy against the Americans. You'll have to work for every inch. They're going to line match Palmer against Shorzy tonight, so Jim. Yeah. Jim. Yes. Jim. You say jump, we say how high, Sanger. We're relying on you to take him out early. You gotta set the tone. If we remember what happened to them last game, this is a good chance for them to pay Palmer back. Shorzy asked Dolan and Goody if either of them messed around last night and they confirmed that they didn't. And you know what? Good for them. Before they head out, Sanguinette lets them know that they want to introduce everyone one by one tonight, since it could be a historic night. Okay, so do you remember how I kept being said that the sexy calendar would come back to bite them in the ass? Yeah, well that time is now because their photos are being displayed during their player introductions. Box six. But once the embarrassment is all over and both teams are all lined up, a beautiful rendition of the Canadian national anthem is played by a 10 year old boy named Dougie DeBow. Oh, 
Oh, and he's still learning how to play the recorder. It's America's turn for their national anthem and they have an actual person to sing it. So yeah, the embarrassment kind of continues for the Bulldogs. And I guess you could say Canada in general here. But yeah, it's not the best side-by-side -side performance that the Canadians could have asked for in this situation on what could be a historic night. But that aside, it's game time. Lucky for the Bulldogs, they successfully set the tone and we get Palmer out of the game early. Nice work, Jims. Nice work, Jims. As we take back to the ice, we see Laurence has made an appearance to cheer Frankie on. And we've seen how well he can do when he has his girl there. And this time is no different. He ends up scoring the first goal of the game. But as for the Sioux, they scored a goal of their own, made by none other than Brady Schnurr. And with that, we end the first period tied 1-1. One one. Despite the fact that the Bulldogs and the Sioux are tied at the moment, there's still definitely a reason to celebrate. And they do. The gem successfully setting the tone for us, and also Frankie scoring an early goal. Compared to their 1-2 start last game against them, I think we would all say that it's better to be tied than to be behind. Now, arriving just in time to see the second period, Pam makes her entrance, and Hitch immediately spots her. This results him in making a goal of his own, because of course you gotta show out for your ladies. But at the same time, we can't forget where we are. And with that in mind, the Sioux responds back with another goal tying the game once more. As Shorzy is sitting on the bench, he sees Laura Moore enter the building and this cheers him up, despite the fact that we just ended the second period tied again. One of the more surprising people to show up to me is Mercedes. And after Michael sees her, he is unstoppable. This man is now blocking goal after goal after goal. Absolutely nothing is getting by him. But it is not over yet. Britt and Melody show up to support Goody and Dolo. And this leads to them scoring their own individual goals. Come the end of the third period, we win the game 4-2. And here we go again with me near tearing up during the montage of the various moments in season two. Oh God. But afterwards, we jump two days after their big win. How you feeling? I'm still drunk. We'll get it out of you now. You've got to keep this heater going through playoffs. Don't worry, Nat. We're winning the no-show and going to the National Senior Tournament. <laughs> I know. So it was Schnur who was fucking you. I was fucking him. Whatever. <laughs> Nat then reveals to Shorty that they got the 50k required for them to host a tournament. Though only two days ago they were 10k short, their recent win against the Sioux got them to their goal with their fans buying enough calendars. And after making their bid to host a tournament, they won it. You got anything to say? Let's set the fucking toe! And that is everything that happened in season two of Shorzy. All right, hopefully now you think you're fully up to speed and ready for season three, because as of recording this, it's already been announced, which means it's only a matter of time before it comes out. But until then, you all have a great day slash night, and I'll see you in the next one.